Okay, well, this is our third workshop of today, talking about the chemistry of stormwater. And it's been a good workshop already. We This morning, we started off with a uh, just a fascinating uh, piece where we invited a, a guest from a local high school to talk about pH, and, and then Griselda Martinez with McCampbell Analytical was helping us uh, understand uh, some of the basics of that. And then the last segment, we got into some in-depth chemistry. And, and we were talking about redox reactions and, and about uh, how pH uh, affects things and, and about organic chemistry and, and also just common misconceptions. But in this uh, workshop, what we're going to be talking about is the importance of what we do in the field and how that affects what they do in the laboratory. And so I want to invite Griselda Martinez with McCampbell Analytical to come up and help me talk again. So Griselda, come on up, and uh, thank you for being a part of this uh, program. So let's, let's come on back. We're going to be talking about some um, interaction, how, how we interact with the field, what we do in the field with industrial stormwater, mm -hmm. to what you do and how you make sense out of the, out of the mess we give you, right? <laughs> so oftentimes that's the case, right? You get, it can be, yeah. Um, and, and speaking of, of messes, what's the, in your opinion, from, from your perspective, being a laboratory uh, technician, mm -hmm. what's the number one mistake that us field people do in giving you a sample? There's a couple of notable um, mistakes um, that I can think of, but of course, um, uh, collecting an improper um, sample containers. We might have a sample that'll come in in like a makeshift container like uh, out of a Gatorade bottle oh, or yeah? something. Yeah, yeah so, they get um, done drinking their Gatorade and exactly. take their or sample. rinse out the Gatorade bottle and then take their mm. sample. So um, collecting an appropriate I sample did, container. I didn't have a VOA, so I needed to grab uh, my, a my big bottle. gulp uh, container. <laughs> That's right. And the thing that you have to think about is um, the sample containers, um, not collecting in the right sample, sample container is a, um, you know, it's a, it's a, um, it's something that can disqualify um, your results. Yeah, we were talking last hour that there are procedures, protocols, mm -hmm. and pretty strict protocols pretty you have to follow. Protocols. So you, you as a laboratory might not have a, ch a choice. You might just have to say, no, we, this we, is invalidated. For compliance purposes, it's not going to fly. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and what other types of mistakes do you see? Um, as far as uh, receiving samples, um, we do get some samples sometimes that are outside of the temperature specifications, uh -huh. so not keeping them cool um, or uh, they don't put enough ice in the container. Um, so we'll get samples that come in at uh, elevated temperatures um, than what's required. Another thing that we see often too is if a client can't sample enough, um, obtain enough sample to yeah. perform all the analyses that um, they need, then they'll want to like split samples, which well, I found myself in that situation. Sometimes when you're in the field, you can only get what you can get. And there are certain tests that might be compatible um, with each other, like some probe tests if you're testing uh, you know, something that's coming off of an unpreserved container like pH and specific conductivity right. or things like that. Right. So there are some that you can share samples with, but of course... Yeah. You want to have the appropriate container yeah. for each test. Now, I know, speaking of those containers, I know McCampbell and other laboratories like you do your very best to make sure we do our best. That's right. And uh, you give us uh, a kit. In fact, I got one right here. Hold on. Sure. Okay. Right here, we have our sample kit. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is something that uh, your laboratory and other laboratories provide free of charge. Yep. And uh, let's open it up because there's a bunch of stuff in here that you, sure. you give us. Now, here in a little bit, we're going to talk about this. What is, what, what is this? Sure. This is this form called the chain of custody. Chain of custody. Yeah, this is a legal document, actually, that um, monitors or records the, uh, the sample, um, you know, the, the from when it's collected to when it's transported to when it's received in the right. laboratory. So this is this document here is super important for the samplers to fill out. Right. And you know what? I should mention to our class and to those who are watching online that we uh, have provided for you on the Stormwater Awareness Week workshops 
we, uh, the, the, the page, so at stormwaterawareness.org, you'll see a handout for this, uh, this uh, workshop, and in it is a laboratory report and a chain of custody document that we're gonna talk about more at the last third of today's work, uh, workshop. But okay. what I wanted to focus on with you, Griselda, is uh, I don't usually get the opportunity to have a chemist uh, with me when I'm out collecting a sample. I open this up and go, okay, what, what is this? <laughs> uh, I'd like you to help walk the stormwater professional through just uh, the do's and don'ts of this kit. And let's talk about, while we're back here, everything we do from the moment we open our kit to collecting the samples to the time it gets to the courier. So uh, what we have in here is uh, two sets so two sets so presumably we're collecting what two samples two samples mm -hmm. now that's real obvious for you and i've been doing this for a while <laughs> um, but a uh, common misconception we see a lot of people making is what is a sample in fact that's really relevant when they're filling out the coc because yes. they got these lines they got to write down a sample mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. What is a sample? Can you just break it down to basic terms? What is a sample? So a sample is going to be, um, you know, a specific um, matrix that you're going to be testing for potentially a, a number of constituents. Okay. Okay. So each one of these bottles. So it's in a here, place and a time. It's a place and a time. Yeah, it's a place and a time exactly. So right. So it's a specific um, 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 collection, of course, of, of an individual piece of. of right. And when you talk about matrix, there's all sorts of matrices that we might sample. There's mm -hmm. air, air and there's solids. Soil. But being that we're at Stormwater Awareness Week, we're going to talk, about, talk about water. Aqueous, sure. So we're going to talk about water. And I got two bags, so presumably that's two samples. But mm -hmm. a big mistake I see a lot of people making, I remember thinking this when I was new in the field too, is wow, look at all these containers I got. I got one, two, three, four, five and six six containers a lot of people i've seen call this six samples is that that's not correct right no this is the number of containers associated with a sample okay so on the chain of custody that we'll see there is actually a space to say how many containers how many containers you're bringing in and the thing that you know samplers have to understand too is as a laboratory when we're logging in the samples in all of these containers we refer to the coc um as cross check as well to see you know oh they said they, they brought in um five sample containers well why do we only have two you know, so okay. the sample. Yeah, we got the, a problem. That's right. The the physical uh, number of samples is important to indicate. Okay. Now, uh, so we're going to call this a sample name. Mm -hmm. how, do, how do you suggest that people name a sample? I mean, from your perspective, or a laboratory? Well, it's going to be something that's going to help the client um, easily identify uh, the source of the, of the sample. Yeah. Um, now I have seen many times sample one, sample two, sample A, uh -huh. sample B. Uh -huh. You know they'll they'll uh, do that, but of course, as as a consultant's uh -huh. perspective, you know you might not care as a laboratory, uh -huh. but as my perspective, what does that tell me? Yeah. Well, nothing exactly. without a map. Uh -huh. So I like to see actual names like a discharge from the holding pond. Okay. okay, then we all know what this is. Or discharge from the holding pond position. You know this location versus you know yeah. further down or. And so, so that's really important. Of course, this one here says tank number two. Mm -hmm. um, now, another obvious thing is that these jars have a sticker on here. Mm -hmm. uh, do you guys provide this? We, we do provide the stickers. Um, and the sticker on here is going to tell you what this container is for. Okay. The analyses that you're collecting in this container. So say, for example, you're, you're testing for ammonia. Um, and um, you know, so oil and grease or something. Then you want to pick when you're sampling um, your um, when you're submitting your samples. You want to make sure that you give the correct uh, sampling container for the analysis that you want. And okay. th these are conveniently la uh, labeled. So yeah, in fact, I noticed you have already pre-printed things on here. Uh, not only do you have the sample ID, 
you have the analysis. Mm -hmm. how, how did the laboratory get this information? Um, it's, it's usually provided by the client. So we do offer customized uh, chains of custody as well as um, you know sampling labels that will help facilitate the sample collection. So today we're mostly talking to industrial facilities. Mm -hmm. They have a stormwater pollution prevention plan and in that they have a monitoring plan. They're going to know what they're testing for. They're going to know where they're testing exactly. for it. So all of this could be communicated to the laboratory. Yes. And that, that really makes it easier than trying to fill this stuff out so in the field. So basically all, all that's left is the date, the time, uh, the location, and, you know, who sampled okay. it. Okay. And is it important to put that on there? Absolutely. Um, hold times, of course, are a legal imperative. So. You want to make sure that you we have the correct um, collection um, date and time okay. to determine whether the, the results are valid. All right. Well, the next obvious thing looking at this array of containers here is I got different types of containers. I mean, I got glass, uh -huh. amber. I got, uh, we talked about these earlier, the VOA vials. The I almost broke that one. <laughs> um, we have something that looks like a pretty scary green cloud in it. Yeah, they're good. Um, so can you talk to the why the different types of containers sure. and uh, and there's liquids in some of these what what's that about so basically the appropriateness of the container for the specific analysis that's going to be sampled is really important to keep in mind um, usually the liquids that are found in the containers it's either going to be um, an acid preservative a base preservative um, some um, dechlorinating agents if you see, you know, fine salt particles in mm -hmm. there. And the one thing to, uh, to understand is um, the EPA methods have specific sampling container requirements because those containers are going to uh, preserve the sample without interfering with the analysis. Okay, um, so it's going to stabilize? It's going to stabilize it, or it's going to help solubilize, uh, you know, material that needs, for example, the, the metals containers. Yeah. Um, those have nitric acid in them. Why? Because it's going to allow the, um, the metals to stay in solution so that okay. they can be analyzed. So yeah, we were talking earlier uh, that when we scoop up a sample, sometimes we'll even see the pH dropping, dropping, dropping. Mm -hmm. There's actually chemical reactions happening in these bottles, and so you add the preservative mm -hmm. to kind of lock things down exactly. to the condition it was when we grabbed it. That's right, and it's going to be um, in order to avoid um, loss, of, loss of analytes, basically. Okay. Um, acids are used commonly because they retard um, biological degradation of organic compounds. So you'll see that your that your oil and grease is going to have a hydrochloric acid preservative in it. Which I believe this is well. This says 1664A. What kind of analysis is that? I believe that's a dioxin analysis. No, is it oil and grease? Oh. Oil and grease. The, the docs is also a 16, 1613. 1613, yeah. So, okay. yeah, that's oil and grease. And I, I mean, I, I myself, I can't keep numbers straight. I, I can't even keep project so, numbers straight. There's too many out there. So, so but uh, it does, it, this is an oil and grease, mm -hmm. and, and we have, therefore, an acid here. Mm -hmm. It does say hydrochloric acid on yep. there. And that's something that uh, someone who's new to this, they need to be aware. That's potent acid, it isn't is it? It is potent, yes. So, you could, you know, if you're not careful, you... You'll burn, You'll yourself, burn yourself, so you should yeah. have some gloves on. You'll burn yourself, or not just that, but be aware too, you know, when you're sampling, if you notice that there's like a, some type of violent chemical reaction taking place, um, you want to yeah. just be careful. Generally what I've noticed is by t you get any amount of water in here, it dilutes it pretty quickly, it's yeah, pretty safe at that point. Uh, now, uh, there's been times uh, I have been collecting a oil and grease sample, mm -hmm. especially an oil and grease sample. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a couple things I want to say about this, but I unscrew the top and I take it to, let's say, a pipe, drilling it up and, and invariably, bloop, and drops a leaf. And it's like, <laughs> oh, doggone it. Now what? You know, and so what I do is I, I dump it out, right? Uh, no, you're, you're you hesitating. You're hesitating. Yeah, what you do I need to do? Um, you should preferably try to pick it out with, with something. You don't want to dump out the Or leave it there? Acid. Or you, you could <laughs> leave it there. I mean... Uh, unless it's a eucalyptus. Yeah, exactly. You're going to have <laughs> so a coin track. So <laughs> I want to fish it out you want to carefully, it out. but I don't want to dump it out. No. Nope. Now, now I go, well, how will Griselda know if I dumped it out and I just fill it up? How will you know? Well, we do the pH strip on these ah. when we receive them in the lab. So if they're not at the appropriate uh, pH, of course, that's another 
disqualification. If it's not at a pH of two, then you know John just cheated the exactly. system. You also want to be very careful when you're rinsing out containers for oil and grease because you'll concentrate the amount of oil and grease. Say that first set, you know, that first uh, sample of aliquot that you that you sampled, and there had an oily sheen on it. Oh. Well, if you dump out your container, your oil sheen is going to want to stick to the walls. There? Exactly, it's going to want to stick to the walls of the container. So, what happens when you collect the next sample is you're actually concentrating. Well, very, you may be concentrating the amount of oil and grease. In very it. good. In fact, you bring up a good point because that's probably why the water board makes a big deal about how you collect oil and grease samples. Mm -hmm. Uh, they first off they want it to go straight into straight the into bottle that you provide mm -hmm. and they really don't want any intermediate uh, containers like sometimes we'll see a dustpan being used for sheet flow or a pitcher you know where we have to scoop water out and if it's especially if it's plastic mm -hmm. it may oh, be it'll, adhering it'll to that that's right yes and so I might be losing Oil but I never thought oil. about what you said is I might actually through that same process make it worse that's right and so the best sample I could do is just one single fill of this and, and send it to the laboratory. Yes. So I might have to think about how I approach my sampling to enable me to be able to fill this. Because let's face it, how do I get sheet flow? You know, it just doesn't work real well. Yeah, you're going to have to MacGyver something up. Yeah. Well, I like that. I like that. All right. Now this, <clears throat> there's some things people need to know about this. This is what kind of analysis? Um, let me see. Yes, it's a it's a metals analysis. Metals. Yes. And I know, as the field person, mm -hmm. I have opened this up right here quite a few times, in my breathing space. Mm -hmm. What yes. happens? It's uh, it's volatilizing the nitric it, acid, it, so you'll get a, a it doesn't feel good. A little cloud of nitric acid <laughs> blown in your face. So. Yeah, it doesn't feel good. No, no. Your no, eyes no. will water. You'll you'll want to uh, be cautious. Yeah, yeah. So uh, when you're sampling this this type of thing, beware. There is concentrated nitric acid mm -hmm. in, vapor form in vapor form here, and you want to open it up away, and fill it up uh, with the appropriate mechanism. Mm -hmm. uh, always preferential to get it as directly into the bottle as, as possible, possible, as few intermediate devices as possible. So there you don't you're not losing any of the of the compounds. And so things like these that have sh what we call shoulders, mm -hmm. how full do we need to fill these bottles up? Um, at least to the shoulder. Um, okay. It depends. Some, some so we don't need a rounded head, no, no, right? No, 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 you don't need a round, not for these uh, type of analyses, although, I mean... Get as full as possible? As full as possible, but you don't want to... You know, I'm not, I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, what I've heard is just get expert, it as full so. as possible. I've always heard at least get it to the shoulder, mm -hmm. uh, it, but don't don't get to a point where, no, no, it's, where it's going to spill yeah, out. Yeah, spill out when it. the laboratory technician opens it. Yeah. Uh, what about you, you talked about in an earlier class today about homogeneity? About that's a pretty big word for me. Mm -hmm. About getting things homogeneous, mm -hmm. getting it equal. Um, how do I? What do I need to think about? Is and this comes into representative sampling about getting a representative sample from that aspect? Well, um, I mean, I'm not 100% sure on as far as how um, you would sample to get mm -hmm. a homogenous sample, uh, to, to obtain a representative sample. I know that there are consultants out there that can show somebody right. how to sample appropriately. Okay. Um, so, so you do want to, you do really want to look at how you're approaching it, and, and if you're new to this, you definitely want uh, to have a team approach of consultants and laboratory people exactly. to say, okay, well, this is a way to get the best representative sample. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, you could make things worse, especially with a TSS, if we go and scrape up a sample and pour it into our container, then we've That's artificially right. added more TSS, introduced yes. more. And here's the VOAs that we were talking about earlier. Again, just to review this, uh, yep. we see liquid in here. Mm -hmm. This so, is a hydro concentrated hydrochloric again, acid. Again, be so careful. You want to be very careful when you open it. Again, you might have some acidic vapors, um, probably not to the same extent as the nitric, but you do want to be careful when you're yeah. handling them. And if you've never done one of these, you might want to practice mm -hmm. before you go out and do the field. But basically, we like to see a nice rounded top. You know, when the lid's off, That's not right. rounded head. Some people, there's different techniques. Some people put some drops also in their cap and put it on. Others will just carefully put it on. Yep. Now, don't crank down too hard. I've snapped more than my share of them, and lots of times you don't have extras. Yep, so you want to be careful. And then flip it over, give it a flick. If you got an air bubble, you got to do it again. But do don't it dump again. it out. No, just take your out. lid off and get a nice rounded head. That's right. So, uh, yeah, this, these are 
how we approach this is really, really important. How we fill them, how we document them, that we label them here correctly. Okay. Um, and, and then how we transport them is also important, it's right? It's also very important. Um, most of these tests are going to be temperature sensitive. So the methods impose a, a, a temperature um, for them to be stored under a specific temperature. And a lot of times they're going to have to be at maybe 4 degrees C or so. So transporting them on Put that in, in non-chemist <laughs> language. 4 degrees Celsius. 4 degrees Celsius. Which in Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit would be what? Approaching freezing, not no, frozen, not freezing, obviously, no, no, but it's, it's getting cold. Chilled. It's super chilled for sure. Zero degrees Celsius would be freezing, well, right? Yeah, zero would be freezing. So maybe we're around 45, 40. Oh, yeah. we're, we're getting it chilled, in other words. Yeah, it's going to be a chilled sample. Um, so, yeah, you want to keep them on ice. You want to be generous with the ice. Now, what kind of ice? Blue ice, dry ice, wet ice? I mean, wet ice is probably the, the more um, simple. Um, you know, a way to keep your samples um, cold. It it it's accessible anywhere. So that's why you give us a, a kit like this, and so the this isn't to throw away, right? No, you can put it back in here because we, we want to protect the glass. Exactly. And you want to fill uh, your con your We probably want device. this also, also in some in bubble wrap, device, which I don't right. have. I'll have to go so get you it. You want to keep them, um, you know, protected. And we probably want to put them back into the bags that they came in, so we keep one you type of sample uh, together. Sample. Yeah, that's right. And so we're going to make sure they're all labeled. Uh, one of the things that we do for labeling is ballpoint pens, when it's wet out, really don't work too well. So we'll get a grease pen mm -hmm. lots of times uh, uh, that will, that won't well, in, a, in a wet environment, will be help us get it filled out. or. Um, and we want that date and time on, so we zip it up. Now, one of the lessons I learned early in my career was to keep my ice and my samples separate. I mean, in the same ice chest, yes, but either put my ice in a bag, in a bag or yeah. put my samples in the bag, but don't keep them together. Because I remember one time I opened up a kit when I got to the laboratory and I saw bottles floating in ice water and labels floating in ice water, <laughs> and the bottles and the labels weren't together. Yeah, so uh, that that's not an ideal good situation. <laughs> yes. So uh, keeping them separate, put them in here, and of course we're going to talk about this in a moment. But we fill this out. Mm -hmm. Also keep it dry. Keep it dry. Uh, so it's uh, and legible. Lots of times I won't actually put it in there because I'm afraid that the ice water might get into mm -hmm. the bag. I might actually tape it to the top, to the top or something. Right so, all right, I got ice in here. I have my, my labels filled out, my COC filled out. Now, how do I get them to the laboratory? Well, you have a couple of options. Um, and you're going to choose an option that best fits the urgency of the analysis that mm -hmm. you're trying to perform. So, when you say urgency, what's the urgency? Well, we're talking about urgency as far as you have something that has a super short, maybe you sat on some samples for a while and they're about to expire. Now you probably want to drive them to the lab as soon as possible in that case. So you have a couple of options. You could either drop them off um, to the laboratory. Um, you could use our complimentary courier service. Mm -hmm. And um, most laboratories provide that. Most laboratories provide that. Um, we offer also a, um, um, uh, an external uh, courier service okay. as well. So you need to get them lab as soon as possible because there's this hold time you were mentioning. If, you're, if the analysis that you're performing is... Um, Time sensitive. Like, now, how do I know? How do I know what it, what hold times I have? Well, basically, samples that are coming off of unpreserved containers, first of all, they're going to have shorter hold times. But the uh, methods do have um, specific hold times, and um, th those type of things are easy to. And you can find those online. In fact, I think online. McCampbell actually, at least she used to, you give a real handy dandy chart where mm -hmm. you, can you can see a lot of the common ones and the hold times and exactly. the containers exactly. that are required for that. Or if, if your analysis requires a rush turnaround time for some reason, then of course getting them to the lab as soon as possible is going to help expedite the, the sample process. So. Now this morning we were talking about pH, mm -hmm. and we didn't see a bottle here for pH. Uh, why is that? Well, because pH has such a, you're supposed to analyze pH just like as soon as possible or on the field. It's, a, yeah. it's actually a field test. Fifteen minutes is what the whole time because is. Because of course, you know, the either, the, you know, the dissolved oxygen uh, might bring down the pH. Um, there's certain parameters that are going to change the pH right. in the aqueous solution. So, um, that's a field test. Because of the chemistry we're talking about. Exactly. There's chemistry happening in these samples, the, and no. pH is the most 
vulnerable. We want to test sensitive. it very right. quickly That's right. and get a, get a field reading. Now, when I get my field reading a pH, what should I do with it? What's a good idea to do with it? Well, well you can do with it if you want to report it um, on your, as a formal um, <clears throat> constituent in your report is you can include it on um, the chain of custody. Actually write it on here in, under can, comments, I think, or actually it. sometimes you have a place right here, yeah, pH. Yeah, exactly. There's and a, time. There's places for you to uh, put that information. And will that show up on the laboratory report? Yeah, you can if you want. If you, okay, if, if you, you request like. it. Yeah, so. Okay, very, very good. So we get these off to the to the laboratory in a in a timely manner. Uh, of course, you know when it always rains, right? You you know it's <laughs> it's three thirty on Fridays, and I call Rosa up here mm -hmm. for a sample pickup. And what does she do to me? She just laughs at me. <laughs> Because everybody's calling her at 3.30 exactly. on Friday for a sample pickup. So preparation. So is, sometimes uh, it's going to be necessary scheduling. to actually run them in myself yeah. to get that there on and time. And if you, if you do want to, um, you know, uh, use the courier service, then you're gonna, you want to really um, coordinate with the lab mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, your samples are picked up in a timely fashion. And sometimes you know when, it, when you're sampling, but with stormwater, oftentimes we have no idea. Of course, yeah, yeah. That's, you can't really yeah, say. We might say, well, rain's predicted tomorrow, but whether I actually get a sample or not, you know, it's really anybody's uh -huh. guess. Well, thank you very much. Let's go over here, and now let's talk about what happens uh, after we sample. Sure. And so I got some uh, reports. Okay. All right, well, you uh, provided us with a, a generic analytical report, and which, by the way, if you're watching online, uh, you can uh, download this, as I mentioned, and uh, reference this, because I know it's going to be really hard to see this uh, during our talk. Uh, and we're, we're going to pull uh, to your attention some of the different things that you need to know about analytical reports, because to the novice, there's a lot of new stuff here. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of information on here. And that's why I wanted you here to help us understand it. Uh, let's start with the back page, though, the chain of custody. We made yep. mention of this earlier. Um, what types of information is going on this document? So, basically, you know, aside from the normal pertinent information as it pertains to client uh, information who, you know, um, the, the, the company name or the client name, um, you know, the emails and the contact information and things of that sort, there's items on here that must be filled out when you're when you're um, submitting samples. Of course, uh, sample IDs. Okay, so right here, important. that's right, right here in this section right yep, here, they'll see ID. if they're looking at, at uh, in their office or at home, they're going to see the left column. And we talked about you know, get creative in naming so exactly. you understand what it is. Yep, you have a date and a time and a number of containers, um, okay. and the matrix uh, that you want to have it analyzed as. Um, and we talked about that in the last class. We did, yeah. That will help you as the chemist know. Know how to uh, process these samples. Now for stormwater, what are they going to say? Water. Water, right? Or actually right here, I think, uh, do you give codes right here? But yeah, there's codes down here that and, you can use. And you know, it used to be, when I started doing this, it was, uh, like S for soil or sl solids and mm -hmm. like SL for sludge and mm -hmm. then AQ for aqueous. Uh, but now now a lot of laboratories are breaking it down even further where it's wastewater, seawater, stormwater. Mm -hmm. So you, whichever laboratory you're working on, they may use a different code. But the, at, the bottom, at the end of the day, it's just let the laboratory know what kind of sample exactly. it is. Exactly. And then and whether there's preservative whether there's or, preserved not. or not. That's right. And there's also codes down here that have the uh, different preservatives that um, you might have. Sure. So you want to use one of those um, numerical. Um, and then we have the analysis requested section. That's right. Um, the analysis, of course, is you, now you're going to know, and I think you mentioned this in an earlier segment, that your MPDS permits are going to have the, um, the, um, the reference methods that you're supposed to analyze, mm -hmm. um, that you're supposed to analyze your samples under. So that's really important when you're filling out your chain of custody is to have that reference number um, indicated on the chain of custody. Because as we mentioned, there's different tests there's for different volatile tests. organics. Exactly. Um, and for solids and yep. nitrates and yep. nitrites, there's different things that are required. Uh, so the reference method is, is important here. And, and then, uh, I, I kind of skipped over it, but there's various lines under sample ID. Mm -hmm. We want to identify our different samples exactly. that we're doing. Exactly. And some of the samples might not require all the same tests. Mm -hmm. 
And it, of course, that's going to be dependent on each facility and the SWIP rider and what they're testing for. Um, okay, at the top, there's some information that kind of seems just general, but uh, it's pretty doggone important, isn't it? It is important, of course. Uh, who, you, who do you want uh, the report to be emailed to is on there, of course. Um, who's going to pay for this? Who's going to pay for it? Yes. Yeah, the project location, um, sampler signature, um, mm -hmm. all pertinent information. Because uh, sometimes I've noticed that um, you'll have a question, and you need to get that question answered very quickly, very timely. And if you don't, it might mean our sample gets invalidated. Exactly, because the whole time might expire or something or it's prepped wrong. Yeah, so you want to uh, get a hold of us. And so having a cell number there, so like I said, it's, when do we collect samples? Friday at the 3.30. At the 11th hour. So we need a number that maybe Saturday morning we can get a phone call. Exactly. Um, okay, and then down at the bottom, you had mentioned this is a legal document. Mm -hmm. How, how's that play out on the bottom here? Well, you have this relinquished by, um, you know, this this, this uh, bottom portion here is um, indicating whose hands this uh, sample is actually, you know, yeah. uh, all of the hands that have been um, handling right. the sample. So, so. so it makes it uh, the legal document. So it starts with, with me that got it in the field and mm -hmm. if I give it to Joe's a security guard he's gonna to accept it exactly and if Joe gave it to the courier the courier's gonna accept the it and gonna accept it the last one should be the laboratory the laboratory, recept the, the laboratory accepts it yeah so. now stormwater sampling isn't as exciting as maybe criminal science you know or drug <laughs> samples right uh, they don't do too many reality uh, television shows on, on stormwater water. sampling but uh, uh, <laughs> nonetheless it is a legal document right there's not a there's not a National Geographic uh, <laughs> yeah. Reality show that's coming up. Like. All right. So, um, how soon can I expect to get a laboratory report well, back in my hand? MAI operates on a standard five-day turnaround time. Um, so even if your samples are short, um, have short hold time, say you have a uh, BOD that uh, has a 48-hour hold time. Well, BOD of course being a five-day test, but um, if you're asking for a, a standard turnaround time, then it's a five days. Okay. And if, if, you know, we're outside of the five days, then, you know, we'll make That's sure That's pretty good. I remember when 10 days was the standard and even 15 in the early days. So five days is yeah, pretty days quick. Is, mm -hmm. And so then how will they actually physically get one of these? So um, the means of delivering a report is uh, basically via email. Okay. Although now we have a client portal that um, clients can log into and we can upload the reports for them to view on there too. So. Yeah, so really good access to it. Now, um, I want to spend a few minutes on how to understand what's being presented here because there's a lot of information oh, yeah. and that's what freaks a lot of people out because they're expecting oh we did six bottles six numbers times two samples 12 numbers is yeah, what i'm expecting but then i see 12 pages full of numbers and that's kind of freaking me out so can you walk us through at sure. least a physical layout of sure. this and why some of this is here okay now, the first thing you're going to notice is your cover page. Um, here it's going to tell you who, um, of course, it's, it's, it gives you the, the information as far as, um, you know, the project ID and if you have a PO number associated with it. And it's also going to uh, uh, inform you who the project manager who was in charge of reviewing and finalizing your report was. So if you have questions regarding your, uh, your tests, then um, and you want and you need a point right. of contact. Then you're gonna um, look for this the okay. whoever, whoever in, finalized it. In fact, that that work order number I think is pretty important too, right? Absolutely. So you're gonna with knowing the name here and knowing, and knowing that work, work order, order number. So the work order ID. That's all you need to do when you call when in. You call in exactly. Um, the work order ID is um, a number that is assigned to. It's an identification number that's sent to your sample from, uh, by the laboratory. So you might call it. You know agricultural runoff, something, something, something. Well, to us, um, you know, while that's important to know, in order for us to keep our books in your computer system, computer systems, we need to assign the samples, work order identification numbers, which is um, what... And every every sample has its own... Every single sample um, has its own work order ID. You might have different fracts of those same work order ID, okay. like, okay, I have sample, and we went back to, to talking about, okay, I have six bottles. Are all these six bottles different samples? No. Well, it's a sample. So say you have sample dash 001. 
well, the amount of um, containers that you have on there might have might be associated with the, the fractions okay. of the collection. So. Okay. And um, then uh, we have here a list of acronyms in, in the stormwater industry. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be stormwater without acronyms. Well, acronyms. Yeah, for sure. And that, that's very, very helpful. But then we get into something called the analytical report. Now, now this is where, what will freak a lot of people out is I see result, mm -hmm. I see MDL, I see RL, and if I know what RL stands for, in fact, I go over right here, and here. it says reporting limit. Well, I've seen a lot of people freak out about this, where they see a number under result, and then they see RL, and they see that is lower than their number. That's right. And they go, oh, no, I am in trouble. I just exceeded a reporting limit. Mm -hmm. Now, are they freaking out about nothing? Um, well, they're freaking out about having a positive hit that is not necessarily going to be considered as a hard uh, positive value. Yeah. So these columns, um, you're going to have an MDL uh, report. Which stands for what? It's the method detection limit. Okay. So EPA methods, most EPA methods are going to um, require for the laboratory to test their process, um, their analytical process, um, by requiring to do an MDL. An MDL is, is a statistically um, calculated number okay. that's, that's based off of low concentration standards, okay? So, um, and reporting limit, let's come back to that because to the non-chemist, they're taking a regulatory limit. They're thinking, I just violated my permit. Mm -hmm. But RL has more to do with the laboratory, right? Exactly. The reporting limit has to do with the uh, sensitivity um, that our lab can obtain for the, for the test. So you know you can detect down to here, mm -hmm. rely, and they're all statistically based, right? Well, they're based the PQ, on performance. The PQLs are, are, the PQLs are based off of a, a performance and calibration okay. um, ranges versus the MDL is, like I mentioned, it's a, it's a st uh, statistical value. Where you can detected. reliably detect down to with down a to good a degree of certainty. Exactly, 99% confidence. Okay. okay, and then the RL is just a little bit below that? No, the RL or, is usually higher, oh, so it's the higher. MDL is going to be lower than the reporting okay. limit. Okay. Yeah. All and right. that's actually part of the criteria of what the method is. Your MDL has to be lower than your So MDL. if it says ND, like it says on this first page for the HEM, which we now know stands mm -hmm. for hexane extractable, extractable material or yep. oil and grease, what we would call oil sure. and grease. If it says ND and it's got an MDL of 1.1 and an RL of 5, what's that meaning? So the, N the ND means that it's below the reporting limit and um, also below the method detection limit. Okay. Now, sometimes, speaking about this, we'll see what's called flags. In other words, we'll see ND, and we might see a little J. Or a positive hit with a J on it. Yeah. So if yeah. you have a hit. Or a po I'm sorry, you wouldn't see an ND, but you see a positive hit with a, with J. a J. So that little J, it's called a J flag, um, is basically going to appear when you have a positive hit that's detectable above the method detection limit, but below the hard reporting limit, it's which the, is a PQL. Okay. Um, so it has a J flag on it because it's technically it's an estimated value. They're like, okay, we saw it, we saw something, we believe it's there, but because it's below our reporting limit of what we can say absolutely, with, exactly, then um, then we got a flag and say we think J. it's there, we think it's this, but it's between these two numbers. Exactly, and sometimes um, you know they might be required a J flag if they're asked to look for as low as possible. Yeah, and there are some permits that require that. Um, very good. Um, and so we'll have different pages here for different analyses. Mm -hmm. uh, here on the next page we see metals and of course here we only see two of them. Why is that? Well, it looks like it could have been that the, these are the two compounds that were requested by the client. Maybe they're interested so in So we see it, aluminum and zinc. So and zinc. for that permit or that SWIP, that's all that they, they were yep. needing to these see. These are going to be based off of the client uh, the requirements okay. of their testing. Well, here we see another on the third page, iron. Why is iron on a different page than aluminum and zinc? Because it's done uh, by a different analytical method. Different tests. That's right. Very good. Okay. And actually, between these two tests, they actually use a different instrumentation. So. Okay. And then we see nitrate and nitrite as mm -hmm. N. And as we talked N. about that in the first part of our uh, program, well, actually the second cl class. The second. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you didn't uh, see that yet, you might go back and watch that. We talked about why it's reported as M. Now let's skip to the end because this is what freaks a lot of people out. It's like, okay, um, here by page 7, I've gotten all the results that I requested, but I see i got 16 pages. i got another 9 pages of numbers, and when I look at that, I see, I see like MDLs and RLs again. I see results and... 
Uh, and Percent recoveries. Yeah, what is this? So um, most EPA methods or standard methods, they have what are called quality control um, items or, or um, checks that need to be um, performed. Um, depending on the type of analysis, if it lends itself to uh, a laboratory control spike, meaning right. you're actually taking the clean reagent, you know, some clean reagent water, spiking it, and testing your process. So you sure actually right. put in a known product, uh, something That's right. into we your call sample? It, we call it spiking um, the laboratory. But reagent. now you don't ever use something I'm looking for, do you? Of course. It has to be something that you're looking for in order to test Oh, the, in that the range. In that range. Well, within the range. Or but if I'm looking for benzene, do you add benzene to it? Not to your sample. Oh. But to the laboratory control spike. Oh. So the laboratory control spike is going to be a clean reagent, um, you know, a, a clean reagent. So you're water. running something through it with my samples. Exactly. They're, 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 all samples are analyzed uh, within a preparatory batch. Okay. Okay. And a preparatory batch uh, consists of, of course, the samples that are um, all being prepped together, along with QC checks, um, okay. which are these items that you see here. The method blank tests the cleanliness of your process. So um, it better come out clean. It better come out clean. And if there's well, anything in it... Then your results are questionable. And because of why? Because uh, they might be artifacts from uh, the process, from a contaminated process. Well, somebody just ran a hot sample through there exactly. and it's still hanging out. It's still hanging out. Um, laboratory control spikes, again, I keep going to uh, laboratory control spikes, what are called LC you know, LCSs. Um, those test the, uh, efficiency, the efficiency of your process. And so, so if you put in a known concentration, then you better come out with something pretty close yep, to that. within, you know, uh, the specified parameters. Um, some methods also lend themselves to matrix spikes, uh, matrix spike duplicate, where we will add, not to the sample that we're going to be reporting as a formal report, but as a QC item, uh -huh. um, a specific spike to your sample to make sure that, um, to verify how the yeah. extraction efficiency is um, you know to verify the extraction efficiency of, of your sample. So so and then you'll repeat it, and yep. you should better get the same numbers. Exactly. And a lot of people don't understand that, but QAQC is looking at both accuracy, which would be the method blank or exactly. the spike. Both, yes. It better come out clean, or mm -hmm. it better come out real close to that number. Yep. But it's also precision. The precision. In other words, can we repeat it? Mm -hmm. And if we did it three times, would our numbers come in a certain tolerance of? Of, of difference. The requirement. That's right. And so that's what all this is about. Now, is, now, uh, is this important to the person who's taken the samples? Absolutely. Um, say, for example, um, you notice that um, you have, uh, and of course, we do our best to, you know, make sure that all our reagents are clean and everything. Uh, but say, for example, you have a, a, a method blank hit that's right above the reporting limit, and you have a sample hit that might be right above the reporting limit. Well. You can draw conclusions from this You could from maybe throw that number out exactly. saying it was invalidated because of something going on in the, in the procedure in, itself. In the uh, laboratory. The same thing with under recoveries or over recoveries. Yeah. Okay. Now, I imagine not only can samples get contaminated in the laboratory, but I imagine they can get contaminated in the field too. Yeah. Are there QA, QC things that can be done there are, with that? There are. Um, we also provide um, containers or if when they're requested for um, field blanks. And so, what's a field blank? So the field blank is basically going to be um, reagent water or, or water sampled from the laboratory. That's been um, um, determined that it's clean. Um, and you'll we'll fill up a sample container with it and it gets transported with the... So you don't, we don't have to do anything with it other than request it and it stays in the kit and it goes wherever the kit goes. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes back to the laboratory, it gets analyzed. You test it, and it better be clean. It better be clean. And otherwise, if it's not, it's telling us something happened in route. In the process that may have contaminated the samples. Okay. Yeah. Now there's also something called a travel blank. How is a field blank different from a travel blank? Um, I'm not sure to tell you the truth. Okay. Um, well, I, I deal with those because I'm a consultant. Okay. And, so what is uh, it? It's kind of the same idea. The last times you'll give us the, ra the laboratory uh, uh, reagent grade water, mm -hmm. so we know it's clean. Mm -hmm. We'll fill it up uh, with that when we do the field uh, the field work. Mm -hmm. We'll fill it up at the same place we fill up our samples. Oh, okay. That way, if something's in the atmosphere, in the especially okay. well, volatiles, if something's in the atmosphere, let's say I'm sampling near a refinery, mm -hmm. then 
I know that maybe it got contaminated when I was doing my sampling, mm -hmm. and not so much it was in the water. Okay, so and then, so it's a travel blank. Same idea. So you'd actually would would open it. And yeah, actually fill it, fill it up at the same time okay. I'm sampling the other sample. I see. So um, this data, this QAQC data, is what makes your report defendable. Exactly. Right? It's, so, it's kind of like insurance that all the right steps that are required by the method were done when performing your test and providing you with uh, your Okay. Data. So you said this data comes to us uh, in our emails. Are there other ways to receive the data? Yeah. Um, of course, the client portal that I mentioned earlier, it's a, a new, a new uh, feature for McCampbell. But also, there's other deliverables that we offer. Um, of course, Smarts, I think, is an electronic deliverable that... Um, Do you actually smart. interact directly with Smarts? Um, I don't know if that technology is even there. Uh, you know, I, we do have uh, experts um, mm -hmm. in our laboratory mm -hmm. that um, are very proficient okay. with all the deliverables that we offer. I know we do, like... Um, but you have EDDs, electronic deliverables. Because um, lots of times we can make mistakes just in human mistakes, right? When we're typing in our, our numbers, mm -hmm. uh, I, I have Lexdexia, <laughs> and I uh, will inadvertently uh, uh, invert two numbers, right? Yeah, I mean. And that happens. It happens. And so if, if we don't have to manually retype it in, that cuts down errors, and That's so right. you can actually give it in a data uh, electronic format. We do offer a number of electronic formats. So. Okay. Well, very good. This has been most helpful in in uh, knowing how to manage our samples because you know a lot relies on these samples. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, uh, you as a stormwater professional, you need to make sure that you're using representative sampling techniques. That you're using good, clean sampling techniques. Uh, we talked about you know uh, paying attention to how you collect a sample that your oil and grease could get bound up on on your intermediate devices, or you could actually make it worse in some cases. And so as stormwater professionals, we really want to pay attention to the details. So thank you for being a part of today's workshop, this third workshop on laboratory basics. And be sure to check in on some of the other Stormwater Awareness Week workshops being offered this week. We'll be back on Wednesday with our second keynote session of the week called The Chemistry of Stormwater for Municipalities. We'll, we'll see you then.